Good morning, students. It is Tuesday, March 24th. Welcome to your first online lecture. Before I start the lecture, I just want to go through a quick summary of the expectations for each Tuesday and Thursday. So real quick, um, you will log on to Canvas around 11.30 a.m. If you don't get there on the dot, that's fine. Just make it around 11.30 a.m. so you can maintain a good daily schedule for class. Um, so it's okay if you log in a few minutes early, a few minutes late, all right, but don't stretch it too far. Uh, make sure when you click on the video, make sure you don't close out Canvas because if you close out Canvas, it's going to log you out uh, immediately. So you want to make sure you keep Canvas open so you can stay logged in uh, so that when I go to uh, take attendance, uh, I see that you've been logged into Canvas from 1130 onward. Um, also, I am going to make it a requirement that you stay logged in for at least the length of the video lecture. So if you only stay logged in for two minutes, I can't mark you as present. So if the video is 30 minutes, make sure you are logged in for at least that. Uh, also, video lectures and the note-taking summaries or the NTS will be found under discussions every Tuesday and Thursday. So click on discussions right after you log in and find the most recent lecture there. Uh, be sure that you complete the note-taking summary on the provided paper or in your notes or on loose leaf. Just complete it. That, that's all you need to do. You know I'm very flexible. Um, and make sure you complete it as you watch the video because in the video I'll tell you when to go to the paper and complete number one, the number two, number three, and so on. Make sure you scan and upload it uh, as a PDF file uh, into the provided uh, folder on uh, under assignments and then once you're done that log out of canvas and you're done um, so again make sure you stay logged in for at least the length of the video you don't have to stay till 12 45 that's fine uh, remember you have until 2 p.m to submit the note taking summary uh, and some other reminders and then we're going to get right to the lecture i'm giving you remember 40 points towards test three and another 40 points towards test four for successfully completing the daily note-taking summary. So as a result, I've decided that test will be a little shorter than test one and test two. Uh, just because you're already doing a lot of work for me, uh, that wasn't um, initially or originally on the syllabus. So the test will be a little shorter than normal um, as a result. Again, make sure all submissions, anything you submit on paper, is submitted in a PDF format. Otherwise, Canvas will reject it. Homework will be completed on my math lab as usual. Nothing different there. And also, did you watch my first video uh, and also complete the assignment for that video? If you haven't yet, you have until Wednesday at midnight to complete that. Uh, it will count as an extra credit assignment where I will give you a free homework, which will, it will replace any single zero uh, for either past homework or future homework. But it will only replace one homework, not, not all the zeros. Okay, I'm generous, but not that generous. Okay, so let's start the lecture. So in this lecture, we're going to be learning about what is called measures of central tendency. Uh, they're very commonly used in statistics. So first, quick definition right here at the top of the screen. A measure of central tendency is a statistic that describes the center of the data. So what kind of statistics would be a measure of central tendency? Obviously, an average. So whenever you take an average, uh, remember the average will fall somewhere in the middle of your, your values. So if you have two test grades, for example, let's say you have a test grade of 90 and a test grade of 100. So the average would be a 95, which is right in the middle of those two test scores. So an average is a measure of central tendency. Uh, we've also learned about the median already. We talked about medians when we were graphing box plots. Remember, medians are not, is a number that is right at the center of your data set. So a median is also a measure of central tendency. And it describes where the middle of your data set is. On Thursday, we're going to be talking about measures of dispersion, which talks about the data values that are off the center. So you have the center and you have off center, either above the average or below the average, uh, is how we're going to talk about uh, those types of measures on Thursday. So let's get right to it. So uh, 
Part A, mean, median, and mode are very common measure of central tendency. So let's first talk about the mean, which we all probably have heard of already. We know that a mean is an average. Now in statistics, the mean is actually defined uh, in two ways. So first it's defined either as a population mean, all right, the entire group, remember that definition, it's the entire group of interest. And then when you take a sample from that, we can also calculate the sample mean. Now in statistics, they like to use symbols that distinguish when your average is from a, mean, uh, from a population and when your average is from a sample. So the population mean has a symbol that looks like a cursive M and it's the Greek letter mu. I'll just put it in quotes. Mu is a Greek letter that denotes that the average is from a population. And then for a sample, we call it X bar. All right, X bar is the symbol that we use for the sample mean. So whenever you calculate an average, what do you do? You add up all the numbers. So you take your first value, your second value, plus however many you have, dot, 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 and we divide by how many there are. All right, that's like any average. Add them up and divide by how many you have. Now, another way to denote this, because you might see this symbol in your textbook, if you're reading your textbook or if you go online, remember when you calculate a sum, we can also write it like this. It's the sum of each x sub i. All right, x sub i, remember that's just a, uh, i is um, an index. All right, i is for index. So x1 means your first value, x2 means your second value, x3, x4, and so on. Okay, so you're adding up all your x's and dividing by how many there are. Okay, now x bar, it's done the same way, but there's a slight difference. You have your first value plus your second value plus dot, 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 however many you have, and you divide by how many there are. Now, in a sample, because samples are smaller than populations, instead of putting a capital N, they put a lowercase n. Big deal. It means the same exact thing as above. Okay? So now we could also write it like this. It's the sum of each data value divided by little n. Is there a difference between these formulas? Not really. The only difference is notation, but the methodology is exactly the same. All right? And that is to add up all of your data values and just divide by how many there are. Okay? So there we go. So you have your population mean and your sample mean. That's the difference between X bar and mu. And that is your first question on your note taking summary. What's the difference between mu and X bar? It's right here. I don't think we need to do an example of this. I think we all know how to take an average. And I think we've done that in class a few times. So let's go right on to the next definition, the median, which we've also covered in class. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that. I'm just gonna review it real quick. So remember the median, first thing is, it's the center value of a data set. Okay. Um, and remember, you have to put the data values in order from least to greatest or greatest to least. It doesn't really make a difference. And then remember how, how can you find the position that is the center of the data set? So remember it's the median is located at position number. It's N plus one over two. Okay. N plus one over two. So for example, just to review this, and then we're moving on. All right, let's say you have 99 data values. Where exactly is the median in that data set? So remember what you do is you take that value, 99, add one and divide by two. That's 100 divided by two is 50. So we don't say that the median is 50. We say that the median is the 50th value of the data set. Okay. So the median is the 50th value of the data set. Or we could say the median is located at the 50th position in the data set 
when the numbers are in order. All right, one more example. All right, let's say we have an even number of data values, like 52, for example. So we take 52, add 1, divide 2, and we get 26.5. All right, so we don't say that the median is 26 and a half. We say that the median, remember that 0.5 means that it's halfway between two positions or two values. So we would say that the median is halfway between. Can you think of where? So 26.5, that's halfway between 26 and 27. So we would say that the median is halfway between the 26th and 27th values of the data set. The third measure of central tendency is called the mode. I mean, this really isn't a measure of central tendency. It's in the book and it's defined that way, but most statisticians usually ignore the mode because it really doesn't tell you anything that exciting. And it really doesn't tell you anything about the center of the data. So first let's go through it and I'll show you what I mean. So the mode is the data value that repeats the most. Or we could say it repeats the most frequently. All right, so some examples. This way you understand exactly what that means. So our first example is, let's say we have a data set like 0, 1, 2, 2, 3. Well, you can see there's only one value that repeats, and that's the 2. So we would say for this data set, the mode is simply 2. All right, the next data set, let's say we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. No number repeats, so we would simply say there's no mode. So you see, this is why I stated just a minute ago that a lot of statisticians don't really consider the mode as a measure of central tendency. This data set has a center, but there's no mode. So the mode doesn't really help describe the center, but there's still a center. So you can see why I, I make that statement about the mode really not being a measure of central tendency. Uh, it doesn't really describe the center. All right, a couple more examples. Let's say we have 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3. So we have zeros repeating and ones repeating. Since they repeat the same number of times, then we have two modes. We have a mode of 0 and a mode of 1. Okay? They repeat the most frequently um, two times each. So they have an equal number of repeats. So they're both modes. Finally, we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3. Now the zeros repeat and the ones repeat, but this time there's only one mode. So 0 repeats three times, but that's more than the ones. The ones repeat only two times. So therefore the mode here is only 0 because that's the one that occurs the most frequently. So you can have all kinds of repeated values, but the ones that repeat the most are your modes. So now at this point, it might be a good time to pause the video and fill in questions one and two on your note-taking summary if you haven't done so already. And remember, you can do that in your notebook also. All right, moving on. Part B here under measures of central tendency is this definition here. So this is actually uh, the beginning of question three uh, to describe what does it mean for a statistic to be resistant. So your textbook says that a numerical summary, which is a statistic, is said to be resistant if it is not affected much by extreme values or what we call outliers. So if it's not affected by much, okay? So for example, let's take a look at exactly what that means. Let's say we have a very simple data set like 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Are there any outliers in this data set now? And we can just tell by looking at the numbers. All the numbers, they're very similar. They're very close together. There's nothing really that far out there that stands out. So there's no outliers. What's the mean of this data set? So what's the average? 
Well, if you add these up and divide by 5, you divide by 5, uh, we get a mean of 2. Can you look at it and tell me what the median is real quick? Think, or not tell me, but think of what it is. It's 2, right? 2 is the center number. So notice when there's no outliers and when the data values are all very similar like this, the mean and the median end up being equal. Okay, that's one example. Okay, second example. Let's say we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 50. Now there's an outlier, right? So most likely that that outlier there is the 50 that's so far off from 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now if you calculate the average, the mean for this, so if you add these up, you get 56 divided by 5 numbers, is an average of 11.2. What's the median of this data set? Think about it. It's 2. 2 is the median. So notice here that this particular outlier, I guess we could call this an upper extreme, just because it's higher than all the other values. So you can kind of think of it as being off to the right side. And what happened here? It pulled your average up. All right, it's like when you have a bunch of bad test grades and you have one really great test grade, you're hoping that that really good test grade is going to bring up your average. So in this case, the mean gets pulled up, so it's going to be higher than your median. And of course, the reverse for that is true. All right, so let's say we have a data set where we have a lower outlier, like zero. And let's say we just have like 20, 21, and 22 as our other data values. So I'm just making the numbers up. So what's the mean for this? Well, if you add up all the numbers, you get 63, and there's four numbers, so you divide by four, we get an average of 15.75. All right, what's the middle number or the median? All right, it's gonna be right here, so at 20.5. Okay, so notice where the dead center is, is your median, but the average, that 15.75, is somewhere here. So once again, we have, in this case, an outlier, which was zero. We could call this a lower extreme because it's lower than all the other data values. And what happened with the mean and the median? It brought the mean down. It's like when you get a zero on an assignment, you know your average is coming down. So your mean ends up being less than the median. Okay. So now let's take a look at this little problem here. This is also on your note taking summary. So feel free to just fill it in as you go along. So essentially there's, there's three things that you want to consider when you're thinking about mean and median and the shape of your data set. Like how do you know when the mean and the median are approximately the same? How do you know when the mean becomes less or more than the median? Because notice that the median usually stays right in the center and that the mean will shift around depending if you have some really high numbers or some really low numbers. So in graph A, so first the shape of this graph, so for A, we have a skewed right graph. Right? Remember that's because your peak is right here. All right, your peak is right there. And the shape of the graph, you can kind of see the right side is really stretched out there. So when you have, whenever you have skewed right graphs like this or shapes, that means you have upper extremes. So there's outliers. You have upper extremes. So when you have a skewed right distribution, that's when your average will go up higher than normal. Okay, Your average will get pulled up and it'll be higher than the median. Again, just think of your test grades. If all your test grades are down here on the left and you get a couple really high grades up on the right, that will bring your average up, hopefully enough to, to your liking. B. So can you see how B, for the most part, is a symmetric distribution? So when you have a nice symmetric distribution, 
And that's like the first example that I showed you in the last slide, where for the most part, it's symmetric. You don't have any extremes up here or any extremes down there. You're going to end up most of the time seeing the mean and the median being about the same, right? Really, we should say it's about the same. They don't have to be exactly equal, but they're nearly equal. All right, and the other graph is just the reverse of A, where we have a skewed left distribution. Something is really pulling the data down to the left side, and what would be doing that? An outlier, like a lower extreme. And what happens when you have some really, really bad low scores? Your mean drops, right? Your average will drop below the middle. So the mean will be less than the median. All right, let's move on. So now we're going to be covering sections 3.3 and 6.1, which are other means, all right, other types of averages that we can take. And some of these you're going to be familiar with because um, you'll see. So weighted means is what we're going to be focusing a lot on. All right, so we're going to look at some examples where the data is known, the data is given, and we can obviously compute all kinds of things from it. All right, so first, the weighted mean, certainly X bar is a good symbol for any mean, but when it's weighted, sometimes you'll see a little W as a subscript there, just to denote that the average that we're taking isn't um, your, your basic average, where you just add up the numbers and divide by how many there are. When you do a basic average, you're assuming equal weight, all right? But when the average is weighted, then that means you have different weights assigned to all different types of scores. All right, so like for example, like if you look at the syllabus for this class, your final grade is a weighted average because you have your tests are worth 55%, your homeworks are worth 25% of your final grade, and the final exam is worth 25%, or excuse me, 20%. So each of those categories, they have different weights. Your tests have the most weight of 55%. So that means if you really want to do well on any one of those, you should really do well on your tests because that will add more weight to your final grade. Okay, so that's an example of a weighted mean uh, where all scores aren't necessarily equal in weight. Okay, so now weighted means, what do we typically use for weight? There are two values that we will usually use as weight. So weight is typically right, either frequency, meaning the number of data values, because we divide by the number of data values, right, when we calculate an average, or relative frequency. Do you remember what that is? All right, remember, relative frequency, all right, so frequency is F. Relative frequency, remember, is the percentages of each of the groupings, okay? So remember, frequency is the number of values, and relative frequency is the percentage of the values that make up all the different categories, okay? All right, so now, for example, let, let's, let's do an example first, and then I'm going to give you the formula for weighted mean. So for example... Let's say uh, I have a class of 10 students, okay? I have a class of 10 students, and these are their final grades. And what I would like to do is calculate the class average, the class average. So let's say I have an X column and a frequency column. So let's say that there are students who got a 70. So let's say two students got an, a final grade of 70. And let's say three students got a final grade of 80, four students got a final grade of 90, and one student got a final grade of 100. Which of you will that be? Hopefully more than one person. All right, so how would you compute this class average, right? So most people would say, all right, why don't I just add up all the scores, all right? So I know that there are two 70s, so it'd be 70 plus 70. There's three 80s, so 80, 80, 80. There's four 90s, so 90, 90, 90, 90. And there's one score of 100. I could simply just add up all the scores and divide by, there's 10 people here. I would divide by 10, all right? 
or actually, let me, let me back up. I want you to see something here. So 10 is certainly found by adding up the frequencies. Okay, 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 1. Now, what if I told you, instead of two people had a 70, what if I had 20 people, right? What if it was 20 people and 30 people and 40 people and 10 people, all right? Are you going to write out 70, 20 times and 80, 30 times and not? No, that'd be absolutely crazy. It'd be a waste of time. So let me get rid of these zeros. Let me go back to my original problem. So is there a faster way to do this? Absolutely. So my X bar, right? I could simply say, all right, well, 70, there's two of them. I can do 2 times 70. There were 380, so I could have done 3 times 80. There were 490s, so I can do 4 times 90. And there's 100, so I can do 1 times 100. And then 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 1. Now, do you see how the 2, 3, 4, and 1 actually is written twice? All right, you have the 2 here and the 2 here, the 3 here, the 3 there. 4, 4, 1, 1. That's very important. You should really pick up on that. Okay? Um, so what do we have here? So the 1, 2, 3, and the 4 that you see there are the frequencies. And remember, what do we say frequency is? Frequency is weight. Frequency is weight. So one way of looking at this formula here, we can look at it as a weighted mean also, where we have... On top, we have the frequency times the, the grade, all right? And of course, here, our X is our, our score. This is our weight. And notice that all you have to do is just multiply them and add them up on the top of that, that expression there. So really what we have here, we have a sum on the top, right? And the sum is each weight times each score. All right. So in other words, we're multiplying these two columns on the top. All right. Now here we put W sub I and X sub I. Right. And I is only going to be four. Right. So my first pair, my second pair, my third pair, my fourth pair. So I'd have like a W1 and an X1. Then I would have a W2 and an X2. Right. And then like the four and the 90, that would be my W3, X3. And the last pair would be my W4, X4. Okay. Now underneath, what do we have here? Two, three, four, one. I'm just adding up the second column, which is the weights. So I'm adding up each weight. Now you might also see in your book, the formula written like this, where it's each um, uh, frequency times each X divided by total frequency. Okay. It means the same thing. So remember frequency is weight. So instead of F, you can write W, and then instead of W, you can write F. All right, so all in all, the, let's calculate this answer. So the answer to this problem is, if you add up the top, everything adds up to 840 divided by 10 is a class average of 84. And really, it is a weighted average, all right, because we have a different number of 70s and a different number of 80s. It's not an equal number. All right, now also... Does this make sense, this answer? It should. I mean, it's a basic average. But also, look where the average is. 84 is where? Let me change a color. Let's, let's try a different color. 84 is somewhere in between 80 and 90. Now take a look at the frequencies, the weights. Do you notice that those two weights are the greatest weights in the whole column? So most of the time, your weighted average is going to fall where most of the weight occurs. And that, and that should make sense. It's like, think of weight as gravity, all right? Whichever category or categories have the most weight or gravity, your average is going to tend to fall near that, okay? Okay, so now, um, on your note-taking summary, uh, on the second page, you're going to see three examples, all right, and, and just copy exactly what I'm doing uh, to complete the problems, okay? So here we go. Uh, we have Marissa's calculus course. Attendance counts for 5% of the grade. Quizzes are 10%. Exams are 60%, and the final exam is 25%. 
All right, and then the next sentence here just tells us what her, her scores were for those different categories. We want to know the course average for Marissa. So for a problem like this, it might be a good idea to, you know, maybe categorize things first. So we have different types of assessments. We have the weight for each of those assessments. That would be on the syllabus. And then we have her grade. All right. So what I would do is make a little table, make a little chart. So first we have attendance. All right, is 5%. Quizzes are 10, exams are 60, and the final is 25%. All right, notice that the sum of the weights is 100%, right? Right? Good. All right, now what did she get for her attendance grade? She got 100. Uh, she got a 93 for quizzes, 86 for exams and 85% for the final. Okay? So, to calculate her weighted average, so remember, just by definition, it's the sum of each weight times each score divided by the sum of the weights. Oop, I think we need a little more room than that. All right, now remember the weights are percentages. Actually, the grades are also percents as well in this problem. All right, so let's start with the first one. So we're going to take the weight of 5% and multiply it with her attendance grade of 100. So remember, 5% isn't really the number 5. 5% is the number 0 0.05 times her score of 100%, which is 1. Remember, 100% equals 1. Plus, all right, next category, quizzes. 10% is 0.1 or 0.10 times her grade, 93% is 0.93. And then plus 60% for exams, she got an 86 average for that. Plus 25% for the final times her grade of 85. And then the sum of the weights, I, we could really simplify this quickly. Sum of the weights, remember, is 1. So the work is really just on the top of that problem. All right, so now you go to your handy-dandy calculator, add it all up, and you get 0.8715. And then times that by 100, her final grade is 87.15. And if you don't like that, we can call it 87. Simple enough. Second problem, number 11, um, classical math problem. Michael and Kevin want to buy chocolates. They can't agree on whether they want chocolate-covered almonds, chocolate-covered peanuts, or chocolate-covered raisins, so they agree to create a mix. So they bought four pounds of chocolate-covered almonds at $3.50 a pound, three pounds of chocolate-covered peanuts at $2.75 a pound, two pounds of chocolate-covered raisins for $2.25 a pound. Determine the cost per pound of the mix. Okay? Now, one thing I want to point out is that any mean that you compute is normally an average of something per something else, okay? We don't say that a lot of time for, for many averages, okay? But means are typically something per something else. So here we have cost per pound. And the one thing I really want to point out is that for every average, what you want to do is uh, kind of figure out what's my X and what's my weight. You can, you can do it very easily by doing this. Put a line in front of the word per, okay? Underline what's after it. So what comes after the line, that will always, always, always be your weight. And in this case, pounds is actually weight, so it kind of makes sense here. But for any other problem, um, that, that second part there is always your weight, and the part in front of the line is my x. So now what I would do for a problem like this is maybe either in your mind or on paper, let's categorize. So we have item, we have weight, and we have price, all right? Now everything is chocolate covered, so I'm gonna leave that out. So we have chocolate covered almonds and peanuts and raisins. 
All right, and we know in the problem that they're going to buy four pounds of almonds, three pounds of peanuts, two pounds of raisins. And we're already told the price is $3.50 for each pound, $2.75, $2.25. All right, so remember we have, this is our WI, prices are XI. So when you go to compute the weighted average, which is the sum of each weight times its X, divided by the sum of each weight. So in this problem, we have first, um, the weight there is four pounds times 350, plus three pounds of peanuts times 275, plus two pounds of raisins times 225, over some of the weights, four, three, and two. So if you're on your calculator, the top adds up to 24.25 divided by 9, which is, now you get a bunch of decimal places, but remember, this is price per pound. So we want two decimal places, so 269, dollar sign, and you can certainly say per pound. So remember, this is a weighted average. So on average, their entire order is $2.69 a pound. Third problem. All right, so here we're going to be computing a GPA. So what I would first like to explain to you is what is a GPA? Like you know it's like a 4.0 or a 3.0. How is it calculated? So now you can kind of figure out your own GPA from this problem. So GPA by definition is the mean. So the GPA is an average. It's really a weighted average. It's the mean number of earned points per credit taken. There's that phrase, points per credit. So remember what I do? Put a line, all right, and remember that after the line, that gives me weight, and in front, earned points, that's my X, all right? or my XI, my weight I for the problem, all right? So now in this particular problem, uh, I'm not gonna read this, uh, let's just go through it. Uh, we have Marissa who's taking a bunch of classes or courses. Uh, she gets a particular grade, which your grade translates into points. So that's gonna be our XI. And each class, uh, now, the problem uh, tells, tells us that she's taking, like the first class is a four-hour statistics course. Sometimes credits are called credit hours or just hours. So credits or credit hours is our weight, all right? So we have here, she's taking a stat class, good for her. She gets an A. Now, an A is worth so many points. So on a GPA scale, an A is a 4.0 or four points. And we're told that the class is a four hour class, so that means she has four credits. All right, now she also has sociology. She got a B in the class. And remember on the GPA scale, that's a 3.0. And the class was three credits. She's also taking psychology, where she got an A. So she earns a 4.0 for that. It's a three credit class. Uh, she's also taking a computer science class where she gets womp womp, a C, and on a GPA scale, that's a 2.0. And that is worth uh, a five credit class. That's a five credit class. And then she's also taking a drama class where she earns an A. So she gets a 4.0 for that, uh, but it's only a one credit class. So let's compute her GPA. So her GPA is nothing more than a weighted average of points and credits. So again, our definition is weight times uh, X divided by the sum of the weight. So in this case, the weights are the number of credits total that you're taking. And X is just whatever GPA score you earn from uh, a grade of A or B or C. So let's set this up. So we would have, so for the first class, 4.0 times 4 plus 3 times 3 
plus 4 times 3, 2 times 5, 4 times 1. Remember, you're adding all these up. And then we're dividing by the sum of the weights. So, oops, 4 plus 3 plus 3 plus 5 plus 1. So that gives us 51 on top, 16 underneath is 3.19 or a 3.2 GPA. Voila! Okay, here's part two of calculating a weighted mean. This time, how do you calculate the mean of a data set, let's say when you don't actually know what the data values are? You don't know what the scores are. Um, so sometimes they're just simply unknown for whatever reasons. Sometimes the data values just aren't given for certain reasons. But if you have enough information about the data set, you can still estimate your average. All right, so the weighted mean of grouped data when the data are unknown or not given. So let's start with an example, and we'll look at exactly how we can get the average of this particular group. All right, so let's say we know at least the groupings and their frequencies. So let's say the one group, the data values take on any value from 0 to 9.99. Let's say we have a second group with values 10 to 19.99 third group 20 to 29.99 and our last group 30 to 39.99 and let's say that we also know you have two data values in the first group three in the second 13 in the third and four in the fourth group and notice the third group has a lot of weight there are 13 data values in that particular group so then in terms of weight I think I would expect my average maybe to fall somewhere in that range there Right? So let's see if we can actually come up with that. Okay, so how do I calculate an average if I don't know the data values? How am I going to do that? Well, here's how you can do it. We can estimate it. All right? We can estimate the mean even though even though we don't know each data value. And here's what you're going to use. If you can't use the data values, we're going to be using the midpoint of each grouping, of each group. So the midpoint is the median of each group. All right, so we're going to take the median value, which is essentially the average value of each of the groups here. So let's take a look. So we see that the first group uh, starts at 0, the second group starts at 10, the second group starts at 20, and the third group starts at 30. So what you want to do is just use the medians of each of those. So I'm going to add a column here to my table. That's a terrible line. All right, I'm going to call it my midpoint. All right, so we can say that the midpoint of the first group is 5, right? Just because if this first group starts at 0 and the second one starts at 10, 5 is a nice midpoint number, all right, or middle number. All right. Now, if you look at the next group, 10 to 19.99, I think 15 is probably a good median. And then here would be 25, and then here would be 35. Okay? So now, what do we do with those? Okay? So remember, frequency is one type of weight. And midpoints, these are an estimation of my unknown data values. Okay, so our X's are scores, their data values, their information. And since we don't have the original values, we can use the midpoint of each group as an estimated value. All right, it's an estimated value of the values in each group. Okay, so now our weighted mean 
is estimated as, okay, that's estimated, not equals, but estimated as. So now we just simply do the sum of each weight times score divided by the sum of the weight, just like before. It's no different, but now we're just using estimated data values. So we do 2 times 5 plus 3 times 15, 13 times 25, 4 times 35. Divided by the sum of the weight. So we're add up your frequencies, 2, 3, 13, and 4, which gives us 520 on top. 22 underneath, and it rounds off to 23.4. Now, does that answer make sense? Let's go back to what I said a little earlier in the problem about where I anticipate the average to fall. Remember I pointed out that would be in this particular group right here. And if you take a look at the value, 23.4 is somewhere in that group that has a lot of weight. 13 of the data values are in that range. So again, weight is like gravity. It's going to pull the average into that category, okay? So now at this point, you should be able to pause the video and answer number six in the note-taking summary if you haven't done so already. And then in the last section here, we're going to be looking at number three, another type of mean, which is also a weighted mean, and it's, a, it's in a different section of your textbook, and they call it the mean of a probability distribution. In fact, in this case, we're looking at discrete probability. Remember, discrete just means numbers that we can count. So discrete values are counted values or counts. I can count them. One, there's three, there's ten. Okay? I don't have to measure them on a scale. Okay, now what I would like to point out here, uh, in this section, there's a new term that is used to calculate or name the mean of a discrete probability distribution. So mean is sometimes called, now this is going to refer to number seven on your note-taking summary, by the way. It's the expected value of the data. of the data or of the distribution, okay? Now that should make sense, right? If someone were to ask you, what grade do you expect for this class? You're probably gonna calculate a what? An average, right? So it's what you probably can expect for your final grade. So it kind of makes sense to call the average or the mean the expected value, okay? So the mean, X bar, all right, is sometimes called the expected value of the data. Now remember, data are the scores, each x. So expected value of your data is written like that. So that expression, e of x, just means the expected value of all the x's, which is the data, okay? Okay, so now we use this really whenever uh, we work with probabilities as weight, okay? So the probabilities will be our weight. Why? Because they're percentages. So remember, that's the other type of weight that we use. We either use frequency or we use relative frequency. Remember, relative frequency is the percentage or, in this case, a probability. All right? All right, so now... So our weighted average, we know, is the sum of each weight times score over the sum of the weight. But now, in a probability distribution, if your weights are probabilities, what do they always add up to? One. So that's going to simplify this a little bit for this section. If that adds up to one, then the formula will simplify to simply this just the numerator, okay? So our x bar is simply the sum of each weight, which is a probability, times each score. So it's the score times the weight, which is a probability in this case. Remember, the probabilities are the weights. So probabilities we can write as the probability of x, or each x, x1, x2, x3, and so on, 
Okay? So that's how your book presents the weighted mean for a probability distribution. All right? Let's do an example. So let's say, for example, I know my x values and I know the probabilities. So let's say the values are 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the probabilities are 0 0.05, 0 0.12, 0 0.27, 0 0.31, 0 0.25. Okay? Now, think about this. Where do you anticipate the average to fall? Near 0, near 1, near 2, near 3, or near 4? Now, if you predict around three, you're probably right. Why? Because the weight is the greatest, 31% probability. All the other probabilities are less. So we're probably going to expect the average to be near three. So let's see. So now, how do we compute the average? Well, we can use our simplified form here. It's just each x times their weight, which is the probability. All right, so remember, that's just weight. So x bar would be 0 times 0 0.05 plus 1 times 0 0.12 plus 2 times 0 0.27 plus 3 times 0 0.31 plus 4 times 0 0.25. And we get a total average of 2.59. Okay, and certainly when rounded to a whole number, it's about three. So our average in this problem is somewhere in between, all right, those two values. And that should make sense because 0.31 and 0.27 are the top two weights. So the actual average fell somewhere in between, which should make total sense because these two weights have the most gravity in this problem. Okay, and that concludes today's lecture. Um, so now you can complete question number seven on your note-taking summary to copy the definition and the formula for expected value of a probability distribution, as well as the provided example that you see on the screen here. If you have any questions about this, feel free to either drop me a question in the discussion board for this video. Uh, if you want to email me, that's fine also. Um, and then don't forget to upload as a PDF uh, your note-taking summary from either your notes or from a piece of loose leaf or from the actual question sheet itself, uh, uploaded onto Canvas under assignments. Have a great day. I hope you're all feeling well um, and stay healthy. Let's end this COVID-19 